Welcome, everyone. We are so, so excited that we have Sarah Nishiro with us today. We're glad you're here for soft bulk. We are hoping to start out by using the chat. We want to know, how are you feeling the change of the seasons lately? How do you know it's happening? Whether you're approaching fall or spring. Um, I know in my Instagram feed this morning, I saw a quilty ghost from Zach Foster, and that's part of how I knew. <laughs> Sarah and I both yeah, know yesterday. First sweater. first sweater for me. I'm in Los Angeles, so I think people in other parts of the country may have already gotten out their first sweater. <laughs> Vicky says, what change? I'm in South Florida. And my mom's there too, um, because it's hurricane season. I think that um, is its own <laughs> unique season and surely my mom is well aware. Uh, yeah, I'm wearing my quilted tank top. It's kind of hard to see the front, but I am wearing a quilt for clothing. So that might be how I know. <laughs> I'm gonna put out a plus one for um, Crocs and socks. It's like my favorite way to walk around the neighborhood. Croc socks, <laughs> Burke socks. You know, I'm not really partial. Depends on the vibe of the day, but I just love that combination because to me, it speaks to such a narrow window of time where it's warm enough that you need socks, but cool enough that you can still get away with sandals or something perforated. You know. <laughs> oh, I love Susan's answer. Susan says, "In my bones, I can feel it." Tanny says, "The air smells different." Allison says the light. Donna G wants to hibernate. Sally says fungi everywhere. Oh, I saw some amazing yellow spiky mushrooms yesterday. Ooh. Me and Bo went to see the um, colors change here in Wisconsin and thought we had saved up for the perfect day for the peak of fall and then there were 40 degree winds and they wouldn't let us climb the clock, the tower to see everything. And so we drove an hour and we found a different tower that we could climb. It was covered in <laughs> snow, but we still climbed it. And we saw a bunch of real wild mushrooms. Mm, Amy says, I feel more alive, time to get busy. That is how I feel about fall also. I feel so happy. Feel all of the bugs dying. <laughs> <laughs> that's what does it for you heidi yeah the yes, billions really of insects does. they're they're going down <laughs> listen people will remember your your outfit at Milan island and they'll know you're serious about the bug situation oh yeah i forgot about your your bug phobia that's that yeah <laughs> some of them are trying to get into the house because of it though so that's not not my favorite part of the season um i like to make a little spray that's uh, dish soap and a little peppermint essential oil and spray it in the, all the corners and the edges and usually that helps keep them away and i need a need to respray <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, shall we do introductions? Zach, you want to start? My name is Zach Foster, and I'm coming to you from Brooklyn, New York, for the first time in 10 months. So if this situation back here looks strange, it's because it's been a minute. I've been traveling the country. I have been doing two residencies out of North Carolina. I have been up to Milwaukee to visit Heidi. I have seen Amanda Natick in Chicago, and I've been out to and where I got to meet Sarah Nishiora, which I have a picture to share with all of you in just a moment of our meeting. And then I went out to LA for several weeks to hang out at Luke's house and break all the stuff. Sorry, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've been doing. So now I'm here. I'm here for the winter. So it feels good to like hunker down and really get to quilting. And um, yeah, I, I work with repurposed materials, which is a lot about what this secret project is about, which I've been told I can't share until it's completed, but I can certainly share a little corner of it. And yeah. Um, that's what I do. I'll tell you more about that, though, coming up in my turn. Heidi? Oh, Zach, it is so good to see you at home and amazing that you saw all three of us while you were out and about. I, <laughs> um, I'm Heidi Parks. I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I do a lot of hand piecing and hand quilting and teaching in person and online. Um, I just sold out in 12 hours a class to teach in France in September next year. So I'm just still over the moon about getting to teach in France finally. And I um, 
focus a lot on diary, memoir, and healing in the subject matter of my quotes. Luke. Um, I'm Luke Haynes, and I do literally no hand quilting, hand piecing of any kind. <laughs> Zach can attest, I'm sure he's tried to, when he was here at my house, tried to find pins, tried to find seam rippers, tried to find anything that you use. It's <laughs> it was surreal, Luke. It was surreal. I'm like, this looks like a sewing studio. Where are all the hand tools? <laughs> Glad about a one of them. Not a one of them. Um, but anyway, so I do um, uh, primarily reclaimed material quilting. So uh, from portraits to usable quilts to um, conversations in fabric from reclaimed textile. Sarah. Hello, everyone. I am Sarah Nishira from Chicago. And I make mostly bed size large quilts. I'll be showing you some of those. And I work with recycled materials. I hand quilt and mostly make things that are geometric. Although lately I've been dabbling in a little um, applique on the side, just li as little studio sketches and things. Um, and yeah, I've known Heidi for quite a while now. I just met Zach this summer. And I feel like Luke, you and I have been sort of internet connected, but we've got to get face to face one day for real. Absolutely. So I've seen you, I've seen you in the little box many times. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all for having me here. It's awesome to join you today. Our pleasure, Sarah. It really is. Let me let me show folks the picture of when you and I first met this summer. <laughs> Come in your way, folks. Come in your way. It was a sweet time because we, a man, I was staying with Amanda Natick for a few days while I was in Chicago. And then you texted and you're like, I'm just down the street. Because how close are you and Amanda? We didn't know this, but we're like literally less than a mile apart, I think. Right. And so you ended up coming over that afternoon and the three of us just sat and sewed and gabbed and had a good old time. Yeah. And here is the quilt that you brought, which I believe you finished since then. Yeah, it's done now. I don't yeah, have I a, a picture. photo yet. Well, I would beg to differ. I saw one with a really cute cat sitting on it. Well, yeah, those kind of photos. <laughs> I don't have the studio shot, you know, the good shot. <laughs> but so much of what I love about your quilts, you see here in this one, which is this kind of soft geometry. I know you do a lot of work to really like kind of tack it down but I guess because of the materials you're using and the how you work a lot with tone tones there's a softness to it that you don't see with a lot of geometric quilting so I'm looking forward to hearing more about your process mm -hmm. as you're sharing I'm just gonna do a quick shout out because it's been a evoked a couple times um quilty ghost is the thing is happening me and Emma McLean from from Chicago I believe but now living in Milwaukee Heidi y'all should hang out we got this idea that wouldn't it be wonderful if you're scrolling through your Instagram and all you saw were quilty ghosts wearing sunglasses. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's, I feel like maybe what the world needs right now, one of the things. So we would love to see pictures of you with a quilt on your head and some sunglasses. And here's a pro tip to get to look right. You got to put the sunglasses really over your nose because otherwise it looks like they're way up here. Just tuck Ooh. that away for later. You're going to upload that picture with the hashtag quilty ghost tag me and emma emma makes it and that way we can see how many we have we're going for a thousand quilty ghosts by halloween i think we can do it zach so i had fun. no idea that emma moved to milwaukee that is very exciting news yeah just in the last <laughs> month or two very recent okay. and y'all need to check out emma's work too because if you're into like the intersection of pop culture and quilts or like secrets and revelations and quilts emma's doing a lot of good work with that so check her out Okay, that, that's my blurb. I wanna to talk to the element of surprise in work, because I feel like I've had a lot of surprises in the last couple of months. And I feel like in some ways, Sarah, this might make a nice counterpoint to the planning that you put into your quilt, right? So this is just kind of a, a the other side of that coin. And I ran across recently, because I'm reading this book, On Becoming an Artist by Ellen Langer. Ellen Langer is, a Harvard sociologist, psychologist who studies mindfulness and creativity. And they discuss dozens of scientific experiments that they've done over time and, and, and extract from their lessons about 
how to remain engaged in the creative process. And one of the things that Langer talks about in this book on becoming an artist is this idea that Robert Frost puts in pretty good pithy statement. If there's no surprise for the writer, there'll be no surprise for the reader. And we could easily substitute that out with, there's no surprise for the quilter, there'll be no surprise for the person looking at the quilt. And so what I've been doing over the last handful of months is trying to find ways to surprise myself with a quilt, to, to let the thing be the thing it wants to be, to stop. I think a lot of times I kind of um, micromanage my materials. I don't know if that strikes a chord with anybody, but like I try to make the material do what I see I want it to do, when instead maybe I should seed a little territory and let the materials have a full seat at the table. So it really is a 50-50 artist material collaboration. But um, as fun as it is to think about surprise, it's hard because it comes with the trade-off of control, right? So we have to give up something to get the surprise. But I'm just gonna say that I feel like in so many ways, and we've talked about this before in softball, that when we sit down to sew, we enter into a space and into a time and into an activity that helps us practice things about living life in a small, safe environment, right? And so I feel like if we can find ways to not only um, encourage surprise in our creative work and embrace surprise and see the value of surprise, then we can also begin to see how surprise can be a positive element to have in our lives at a time where it doesn't often feel that way. The last couple of years have had a lot of unpleasant surprises, but it doesn't mean all surprises are bad. So I wanna show you about some surprises that I've had recently. So Luke, you may recognize some of this fabric. Every single bit of this came out of one of your fabric strip bins and I got it done and I was like, yeah, that's, that's cool, you know. No shade on the fabric because the fabric's great. It's just, you know, the person put it together just didn't, <laughs> didn't do a very creative job. And so then I woke up the next morning and I found this sleeve of a t-shirt I had cut off the day before. And you're about to see the t-shirt in a second. And so I was like, well, let me slap that t-shirt down. I slapped down some more gingham. And I'm like, there we go. We've made it. Quilt is done. Surprise, it's not done. So I go to the Los Angeles <laughs> Farmer's Market where I meet up with a bunch of people from the Nook. And we have a real life sit and so so in circle at the farmer's market. And you see Debbie Weiss, Specs and Keepings there. She's in the glasses, the curly hair. And then you see Milda with the red hair right beside me. Milda works in costume design. And Milda brought a bunch of uh, fashion scraps. So fabrics I'm not used to working with. And you know, fashion scraps are cut in really funny shapes. So shapes I'm not used to working with. And so just to refresh your memory, that's where we started. This is when it started feeling cute. And I'm like, oh, it's done. And then I was like, wait a second, let me, let me slap, slam on some of Milda's hot orange uh, fashion fabric there. And I love that. It sits that way for about 24 hours. And I'm like, I need a little bit of that cheetah-esque print. And now I feel like it's actually done. But it just kept surprising me. So the trade-off of mm, not using materials that are maybe the easiest to work with because they stretch is that you get some really interesting surprises in composition because that stretch will lead you to to shimmy a little bit. Now, Deborah Weiss came and gave a workshop, the first ever workshop on the Nook, this time last year actually, called Layers of Life, in which she shows us this kind of ruching, this extended expansive ruching technique that they've developed over time. And one of the little tidbits I picked up from Deborah's workshop was when it comes time to quilt, a lot of times Deborah will flip it over to the back and quilt entirely from the back. And what that essentially does is decouple the quilting pattern from whatever composition you have going on on the front of the quilt. So you're, you're not consciously or even subconsciously responding to what you see on the front. You're just creating a whole new pattern and allowing yourself to be surprised when you flip it over. So I took a page out of her book when it came to this quilt. Luke, you might recognize that Scooby-Doo print also came out of your stash. And some of these other fabrics either came from Milda or Lisa Hopkins, all from the Los Angeles Farmer's Market sit and sew. But I quilted this on the back and I tried to take a picture of the back to show you, but you can see it's such a wild print that it's pointless to even show you. But you can see the effects of what it looks like when you create almost this overlay of quilting design on top of a quilting, um, patchwork that has nothing to do with one or the other. 
another surprise, another way of, um, another thing that got me back engaged in the process was when I started seeing how that semi shimmery black fabric at the top was ruching and getting those sweet little ripples. So after I saw that happen, I tried to encourage more and more of that. I didn't know it was going to do that, but when I saw it, I liked it. And then these are some pieces that you haven't seen yet. I haven't shared them anywhere. Um, they're works in progress. This one's not even done yet. This was a surprise to me from start to finish because we were in Palm Springs for a little getaway weekend, one of the weekends we were in California, and went to a vintage shop and found all this great vintage table linens. And the guy was giving, basically just like, Zach, take them. I think I paid like two bucks for this long, long table runner. And I wanted to, I knew I wanted to put it down on black and to play with the contrast. Um, I think that was inspired a lot with Ivy Sands work. Ivy Sands has been working with a lot of little quilt scraps and then sewing them down on black, which felt very archival and very kind of seem museum situated, right? And so I know I want to do something similar here. And um, when I laid <laughs> this table runner down and this and the, with the folds, the flat press technique I like to do and play around, I I just, I saw this beautiful human body and I'm like, oh, so this quilt's about sex. Let's do it. Let's go there. So um, that's what this quilt's working on is in fact, it's sparking, um, I think a line, a series of quilts. So we'll see where that goes. But the surprise element is not just the laying down of the fabric, but it was also in the binding of it because there came a point where I was taking out some stitches because I didn't like how the binding had been put down and it drew up the entire top edge as you see here, giving some kind of physical mass, some soft bulk, if you will, to this body that I'm looking at. And that's something that I'm still in the middle of playing with. It'll be interesting to see how it comes out in the final version. But that was another happy mistake slash surprise. Would never have thought of that one on my own. This table runner also has some, you know, some little moth holes and things, which is great because I'm thinking about what's it like to be physically in a minute, 42 years old, you know, we got some, we got some knocks, we, we've taken some things, got some scars. So there they are. I figured I'd just highlight them, stitch them on down. Zach, I have this to, is another... you to ask a question. So you've been yeah. making quilts for other people, for artist residencies for a long time. Yeah. And this green quilt, obviously having to be a secret is for somebody who's not you. Mm -hmm. Is this a quilt that you are making just because you, Zach Foster wants to make a quilt? Just for me. Mm -hmm. That's very exciting. Yeah. Okay. Just yeah. Thank it. you. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I, I would hope everybody has that space for those personal projects that you do just for yourself. We love making quilts to give us gifts and to give away to loved ones, but there's nothing like doing something just because you yeah. want to do it. Having, you know, finished a residency a year ago, I, I remember how free it felt to just, oh, just because I want to, not because I'm doing a year long residency. So, this is yeah. very, I've been so curious to see when you have a little more free space, which thing you're going to work on. Thank you. Super excited. And the residencies have been cool. I mean, they were very oh, yeah. expansive, it's liberal. Your own thing, but it's a different kind of your own thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That little chartreuse th thread, happy mistake there. This is the second piece in whatever series this is going to be. Um, this is taken off of the way two bodies may lay in bed together. and. I, I started in the top left corner with the quilting and wasn't happy with it, but I liked how all those back stitches at the end of the rows were lining up to create some neighborhood. And so I continued to play with that throughout, more intentionally throughout the rest of the composition. So I like this idea of like what's happening unintentionally and how can we make it more intentional if that's what we choose to do. The border was unintentional. I like how it creates this tasseled effect at the bottom. Some kind of like sacred banner feel. And then lastly, the quilt that Heidi just alluded to, this is a thread up quilt. Thread up is an online um, thrift store platform. And they've commissioned me to make a quilt out of all these garments that they couldn't sell. Cause I guess people send them stuff, they sell it online, but these have like busted zippers and buttons and stains and things. And so they sent me this big box. I'm using like a fourth of it in this quilt, which I'll show you in a couple of weeks. Um, 
there's some of the colors I picked for the palette and the background, but there have been a lot of surprises with this quilt. Namely, this one just happened last night. I just think it's the cute, cute as a button, Amanda said, cute as a button. So the, this is, you're, you're looking at the binding on one edge where it goes over the button over a collar on the neck. And when, with, when you're hand sewing, you can get away with, you know, sewing right over buttons. You can just kind of work around it. Machine sewing would be a little more difficult, but that, that was a sweet surprise. And there are points of this quilt where the clothing overlaps the edge of the quilt. So that also felt fun. I, my original intention was to kind of prop it all into some vaguely organic shape, but a couple of things just wanted to stay poking out. So like there's a cargo pocket that's going to stay poking out. Just having fun. Okay, so to conclude, how to stop micromanaging materials and get surprised. Here's a couple of things I've thought about. Number one, staying engaged. And this is something that I really want to work on, not only in my own practice, but to formalize it and get us thinking about it more in the nook, which is mm, how, when we're, when we're looking at each other's work and offering constructive criticism, what are those signs of engagement? What are those signs of surprise where maybe the artist changed their mind in the middle of creation? That's what I would really like us to start focusing on because I've seen how mm, enriching it can be in my own practice. Work from the back, like Deborah Specks, <laughs> Deborah Weiss from Specks and Keepings. Pick colors at random. You know, a classic quilt guild activity is to just put a bunch of fabric in a bag and you draw it out, and that's what you got to work with. Luke, I can't help but think about a something a professor of yours told you at one point in time, which was find the ugliest color you can imagine and then make something beautiful out of it because you won't, you can't rely on color at that point. You have to rely on other elements like composition, line, texture different things. Collab with a friend. Maybe they make half a quilt and you make the other half or vice versa. Learn a new skill always helps. Applique maybe. And consider hand sewing. I'll just throw that out there because you can mess things up real quick on a machine. Heidi, you've talked about this before, right? You can get really carried away on a machine. And you can mess it up and it's not the happy kind of mess up either. But when you're hand sewing, our, our fingers have a wisdom of their own and they can fudge things like that the seam the binding around that button that we saw just a minute ago that can only be done with hand sewing so i think hand sewing is more flexible and therefore gives us more room for surprise so with that don't forget to post your quilt to ghost and i'll pass the torch on to a good friend heidi parks thank you zach um my friend Heather Kinian, a Chicagoan, was just typing in the chat that Audrey Essery has also been posting her quilty ghost photos lately. Um, if you're able to, st I don't know if I can just take over screen sharing. There we go. <laughs> um, thank you. But Zach, that um, it's just so beautiful to see what you're up to lately. I really enjoyed that. Um, I am excited to share about a new project that I am working on, a collaboration to your point. And just play from the start. Um, and so actually on Instagram this month, I'm part of a sequence of prompts that are very similar to what you were sharing about, for example, put some fabric in a bag and pull it out and see what you get. Um, Carolyn Friedlander just made a really beautiful quilt with that approach for our challenges. We're giving them on Wednesday, so you can go back in our feeds and see uh, the challenge that Tara gave to Libs, and then the challenge that Libs gave to Carolyn Friedlander. And this upcoming Wednesday, tomorrow, Carolyn will be challenging me to do something that I don't normally do. And the following Wednesday, I will be challenging Tara. So the four of us are teaching this creative habits class in November, and we're very excited about it. And it felt like a wonderful opportunity for me to share a little bit about creative habits. And I love that Audrey Essery just came up because our very, um, our second ever episode of Soft Bulk, our first Soft Bulk guest, Audrey Essery, um, when she was a guest, I believe I shared about this idea of taking Polaroids or Fujiroids 
of my quilts to track my time management and to remind myself, especially that I am indeed making quilts pretty often. <laughs> uh, sometimes it can be easy to forget that. So this is something that I did with uh, taking pictures of my quilts. And at the beginning of doing soft bulk, I was near the beginning here and I was taking a picture each each time I finished something, because just like we were talking with Sarah, sometimes you can have a lot of quilts done, but you haven't taken the fancy finished photo of it yet. And it doesn't feel quite checked off the to-do list until you've done that. So here I take a real rugged, usually in the middle of the night photo when I finish the quilt to look at it. And I got to the end of the year last year in 2021, and I thought, wow, I'm being pulled in a lot of different directions. Uh, some of these quilts were made for workshops that I was teaching online. Other quilts were made for invitational opportunities to teach abroad, and other quilts were made for an artist residency that I was doing, uh, and, and even a quilt for a gift. So I realized, I was, I was feeling like, oh, I never have time to sew, but obviously if I made oh, 12, yeah, 13 things that I was having time to sew, <laughs> I was just getting pulled in a variety of directions. So this is my 2022 schedule of photos so far, and I'm chugging away on getting them done for the year. And I feel as though having gotten to look back at those Polaroids, I have been making a lot more things that feel like they were um, maybe not, quote, just for me, but I decided as a goal that I set in 2022 in January that they would be more strongly for my art practice. And that certainly you can see, I gave myself credit for sewing a shirt and some pants for myself. But in particular, these last four finishes of the year were all very serious quilts for Heidi the artist, as well as um, this quilt earlier in the year. And I've been a finalist twice in a row now for the Mary Knoll Fellowship. And I just finished my application for that fellowship this earlier this month and it felt like a good thing to share about because it was one of the main instigators for why I wanted to give more attention and focus to my art my fine art um, focus on my quilts so this quilt is one that I made alongside my good friend Zach Foster we were in Madeline Island and I remember driving up to teach with him and talking a lot about wanting to make a quilt that could help solve a problem that I have with floaters in my eyes and how might that look and we're brainstorming a lot of different ways to do that and I was able to use many of those different approaches in this quilt and this was neat because it was a way to extend my magical thinking series which um are also in my Mary Knoll Fellowship application. So it toggles into these, magical thinking attempt number one. And then this one is attempt number seven. And it's transitioning from being specifically about a problem of hormonal imbalance to using my quilts to cast a spell or manifest something or be a cure in a variety of different ways. So this is a quilt that is about um, maybe making friends with my floaters, maybe making them so that I can't see them anymore. Uh, but certainly looking at that problem, poking it around, working on it. So uh, these are both in that series. They're more familiar quilts and they were uh, both times the favorite works of the judges for the Mary Knoll. So it's helpful to include them uh, even though they were made in 2020. This is a diary quilt that I made to look back at 2021 to try to understand what happened that year and why it was a particularly good year for me. This is a quilt about scraps and trying to notice those unconscious things that I'm doing. When I think I'm doing something else, I end up with a lot of white scraps because I use white backgrounds for a lot of my quilts. And then sometimes I 
cut away that backing as I put applique over it. So I end up with weird shapes from that, as well as I back my quilts with unbleached white cotton muslin wide yardage. And so then every time I make a quilt, I end up with a strip that is 20 feet long by two inches wide. So there are a lot of long skinny strips that I end up needing to do something with. This is the second quilt in that series. So looking a little deeper in my scrap bin, finding even some pieces of curtains and other things in there. This is my most recent finish. I was looking at the calendar in September and I thought I really want to get one more quilt done for my application. So this is magical thinking attempt number eight. And it is connected to my personal life, my more romantic life and other just like how, how I want my living situation to be, how I want to show up and um, caused a lot of reflection looking back at past living situations and past romantic life choices and um, following Brene Brown's advice, I'm not necessarily sharing all of those gory details very publicly yet, but I have been watching so many YouTube videos about um, relationships and, and different dynamics that can happen in them and different ways to think about living situations. So this piece has a lot of furniture in it, uh, which had me thinking about home and it is me thinking really actively about how I want to um, prepare for the future and live my best life and that it is in the same spirit of that magical thinking series of trying to um, be healthier in general. This is a quote. Katie, I just want to say that that blue in that quilt is magic. Ah, so that is a scrap from when I was at your house. Uh, I was, <laughs> it, I was a bridesmaid for my friend Bridget and I had to trim the bridesmaid dress and I actually just found another strip. It's like, it doesn't end. I thought I put it all in this quilt, but I only put two of the three layers of bridesmaid dress trim at the bottom of the quilt. But yeah, I'm really loving that. It looks like a black and white quilt, but actually it's more nuanced than that. There's a fair amount of pink and tan and yellow and blue. And uh, thank that you. Blue just gives it such a yeah. profundity, such a depth. Mm. It feels very cosmic. Okay. I just wanted oh, to throw that out there. I love that. Feel. Yeah, I haven't. Um, it's the newest one. So I haven't gotten to live with it as long, but um, it's really helpful to see. This one I'm just so pleased with. It's the last one in the application. I it, I finally got into the Quilt Alliance exhibit at the Dairy Barn, which I've applied for before. So this is the quilt that I got in, which is very exciting. Um, a lot of thinking about ambiguous loss in this quilt as well. My grandma Mimi is still alive, but has had dementia since 2013 and been kind of slowly losing her. And I've been returning to Santa Fe to remember the most vibrant version of my grandma that I know. So this quilt is called Mimi, 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 and <laughs> her honor. Um, here is my artist statement that I've worked on a lot for the Mary Knoll. And last year I kept it pretty much the same as it had been. And this year I, uh, changed it up quite a bit. So when it's on YouTube, you can pause and read the whole thing if you want. Um, but my friend Paul Salsader, who works at the Portrait Society Gallery here in Milwaukee, he was my first step in rewriting, which, you know, for 300 words, I must have put at least, at least 10 hours of really active work into the statement, if not more. And he helped me pull this sentence from the middle of the old statement and put it at the top. And so it begins um, say, by saying conceptual works often originate as a problem or a frustration. And certainly that's very true of my magical thinking series. Um, I was also very inspired by my friend and ah, artist that I just love, Deb Sokolo, who I met in the fiber program at SAIC. And she's a professor at Northwestern University. 
Um, and she's been in my artist statement on my website for almost a decade now. Um, and she's really into the evidence board. And so I, I put in here because it felt really true, much like an evidence board in a crime drama. My work is an obsessive reflection focused on the diaristic personal pain and the everyday. Um, so lots there of thinking about my work and why I make it and that that kind of thinking and reflection is a really important part of my creative habits and the things that I repeatedly do. So um, creative habits could involve feeling stuck in a rut, but it can also be about how do you show up every day? How do you make work in a way that fits in with your life instead of fighting against it? How do you remember that you have time to sew or remember that you actually are sewing frequently, even though you suffer under the illusion that you never have time to sew? Um, so this is our class. It'll be in our thank you email um, to have access to know more about it. And we meet both on Thursdays and on Tuesdays. So. Um, just a little window into the Mary Nolan, how that was a, a really direct reflection of me thinking about my creative habits, and then that I'm going to be sharing a lot more about creative habits with some friends in November. Heidi, I bet people would appreciate, maybe if you could drop a link to the Mary Nolan Fellowship or something, people mm -hmm. had questions about wanting more information about that, so. Yeah, nice yeah, share. yeah, NOLA is N-O-H-L, and it's just for Milwaukee, so if you're in the Milwaukee area, you can apply, and they give established artists $40,000 to do with what they will, so it's a very attractive fellowship for those of us in the area, and just incredible artists who who have gotten it over the years and they have a, a great series of lectures where they get to speak about their work. So um, yeah, I will definitely link to that so that if you wanna know more about, about those artists, you can. Just this last Wednesday, I heard a lecture from Jason Yee who received the fellowship last year and it was awesome to get to learn about his practice. All right. Is that the show that you and I went to when I came to visit? Yes, uh-huh. Yes, you and I went to attend the Mary Knoll. And then we got to see work from Nirmal Raja, who received it two years ago, the first time that I was a finalist. Um, these are people who've been finalists on many occasions. Um, Jason actually has received the Mary Knoll Fellowship in the established category twice now. So he got it. You can apply every 10 years. So he is a two-time recipient, a real, Milwaukee rock star and professor um, at, at Myad School of the Arts here in Milwaukee. So really, really interesting to get to see the work that comes out of it. And I think to to feel the push that that you get just from being a repeated applicant, that the judges um, ask such interesting questions and are, are looking at I've, sh I've shared before how I was trying to create an umbrella for the work. So it feels all interconnected instead of I did this for this and that for that. So um, I, th I think it's been just a very helpful, fruitful process and is the kind of application that feels healthy and helpful for me. And having my resume up to date once a year for that has led to other opportunities because the resume is up to date and it's not so hard then to apply to other things. So. A lot of really helpful habits in there. Luke. Well, good morning. <laughs> um, so what I, let me do my screen share. Oh, not that button, that button. Um, hey, man. Don't worry, Zach, it's still on Keynote. <laughs> <laughs> if keynote will come up i will share it with y'all so um also if you hear the garbage truck in the background that's just the ambient noise of of los angeles this morning sorry and you're welcome um so uh more than kind of narrating this morning i wanted to take a 
idea that I'm seeing in a lot of Sarah's work and actually saw um, in Zach's presentation and certainly see in Heidi's work um, and just talk about that rather than kind of um, present. So I threw this up on Instagram yesterday or whatever and just uh, with the kind of conversation about um, color within color, right? So I use reclaimed materials and what that means is um, the tone, uh, hue, shade, all of the, you know, color words are dictated by what's available at Goodwill. Uh, I use Goodwill bins, so I buy it by weight. So I'll go buy hundreds of pounds at a time uh, or 30 pounds or whatever, <laughs> whatever I'm there for. Uh, and, and so uh, Zach was talking about sort of micromanaging. And I think that's a really interesting point. And I'm a big micromanager when it comes to the sort of making the, the things go together. But on the other side of it, um, and I think, you know, and I'm excited to hear from Sarah more and kind of ask some questions or, or you know, unless she tells everything uh, about <laughs> kind of the, the conversations that go into some of the um, tone choices. Here's a collaboration I did with Heidi uh, where we each made a half and then sewed those together and then each quilted half of it. I mean, quilted, you know, half <laughs> and then sent it back and forth. So it's kind of these, these two conversations that come together um, with these two tones. And, um, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm more just sort of throwing out there these concepts of what it means to find dynamism in the material. So in my work, I do a lot of kind of trying not to micro, I don't micromanage what the colors are. That comes from what's available the day that I buy fabric. So I do micromanage where the points match just because I want quilters to take me seriously sometimes. And, uh, you know, I really <laughs> like a square quilt, uh, 90 by 90, you know, that's kind of, I, I try to aim for that every time. I don't meet it uh, most of the time. It's usually like 89 and a half or 92 and three quarters or whatever. But, you know, um, my point is, for me, where this really beautiful ebb and flow comes is from where the material talks to itself, right? So this is a commission. Um, all those are clothes I bought from Goodwill uh, by the pound and then cut up, sewed together, cut up, sewed together. Uh, and so these like little kind of sprinkles and sparkles of, of, of tone come from the method of design. So the fabric is a conversation between itself, myself, and the people who've discarded it, rather than me going and sort of finding the perfect shades, which again is, is wonderful. And there's, um, you know, such a good reason for all of that. But, but again, as you're kind of having these conversations with your object, um, you, you find that there's there's these sort of areas to to expand, to breathe, right? The, the fabrics in these actually create some more of the, the conversations that are between me and how I'm able to find material rather than just me and someone looking at it, right? So that, that, that happens afterwards, but I also get to have a conversation uh, methodologically with the material and the patterns and the texture and the, I mean, the, the fabrics, if they're stretchy, they stretch. If they're not stretchy, they don't. And so they end up kind of filling in to kind of um, match each other in some really beautiful ways that I wouldn't have chosen. Um, I remember I was having a show somewhere. I was probably somewhere prestigious only because I remember that someone came in and was just like, oh, I just love how it doesn't matter to you that nothing matches. And I'm just like, huh! <laughs> like that's, that's, first of all, that's fully not true. I'm very fastidious about my cutting. However, the fabric that I use is never on grain. It's never exactly biased because it's, it's from clothing. And I try to cut it to honor the way that the pieces fall when I deconstruct it. And so there's like, you know, all kinds of different stretches to it. And so I don't mind that it sort of breathes in ways, but it was just really funny that somebody was, was giving me a compliment in a way that I was like, uh, well, <laughs> but, but anyway, so, so my point being that that's the, the conversation that happens and that's the, the kind of surprise. And for me, some of this kind of uh, beauty in something that I'm not 
in control of. I create the system, but I don't pick the tones, right? So I go and I say, okay, how much color white is here today? I'm gonna get you know a shopping cart full of it, then I'm gonna go home, cut it up into pieces, and then sew it together and kind of see what what that uh, what that makes. Uh, and for me, um, that becomes kind of this learning experience. Um, you know, where Zach might be a little bit more kind of not micromanaging about whether corners match and shapes put and you know, if it overlaps, applique it down, stick it on, have a great time where I really want to um, sometimes, I mean, you know, uh, there's, there's all kinds of quilts and we make a lot of different stuff. But for me, I really like to, I love the geometry and the math of quilts. I love it, love it, love it. So for me, I do want that to match, but my sort of breath and life and, um, uh, surprise comes from what it's made out of. And again, I'm excited to hear more about uh, Sarah's work because I definitely see it in there, but I haven't had the opportunity to ask more about that. Um, I threw a couple of these in here just to kind of show that um, the quilting also makes a big difference in the conversation about material. So these are all three, um, the last picture is kind of terrible, but these are all three made the exact same way. They're small double wedding rings. The outside ring is all white. The inside ring is all made out of uh, men's shirts. Um, but the quilting is different between the three of them. So you can see how just the quilting also gives you kind of a, a different sense of allowing some of that, um, the breath to take place and whether the piecing actually shows up more or whether you're proving it with the, the thread or whether you're kind of hiding it in these kind of different ways. So, you know, there's a lot of um, finishing techniques also on top of that, that, that allow kind of some of the, the breathing that happens within not being too um, overbearing. And I find that, I find that it's really important and you know, maybe Zach, you'll disagree with me here, but I think it's really important to have something that you're overbearing about because you wanna prove something. Like every project you wanna be like, okay, look, this is what it's about, right? And maybe it's piecing, maybe it's what the material is, maybe it's uh, how heavily it's quilted or, or, you know, all of like, or even just the kind of tails of the thread that, that uh, you know, create a grid or create a pattern or something, something that's like very intentional, I think is, is actually very important, right? I, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of beauty and surprise, but I also find that there's a lot of beauty in doing kind of one aspect of it very purposefully that kind of proves your intention as a maker, um, you know, and that's, that, that, that's across the board what that happens to be, what you're interested in, whether it's pattern or color or texture or size or scale or flatness or, um, subject matter, you know, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I find that there's kind of a, a beautiful ebb and flow in the work of artists that I love across mediums between their discovery and their intention, right? So you come in with an intention and you sort of knock that from all the way from A to Z, but along the way you get to create some, some discoveries that get to kind of leave artifacts that, that you can showcase through the, the sort of life of the work. Um, here's just a couple more of um, backgrounds for these these projects, um, and just what it what it means to just go pick all the red fabric available that day, or all the white fabric available that day, and it's certainly in quotations because um, <clears throat> there's a lot of purple and pink and green and things. But um, I get to I get to create a method, and then from that method, I don't know what it's going to look like until the whole darn thing is done. And I get to come back and say, oh, that's cool. Or, oh boy. <laughs> uh, and, and that's that's a joy most of the time. Black fabric here. Um, and just one last quilt um, to showcase here. This one is um, sheets, jeans, and dress clothes. So you kind of, each of those tonal areas are made by a different material type. Um, and so the kind of modeling that happens in those is by material type. So I didn't choose which particular material, but I did choose the material type. So all the sheets, all the jeans and all the, the dress clothes, you know, suits um, went in to make this. So the, the kind of tonal shifts happen by uh, material. So for me, the important through line was material type. And then I got to discover what happens by allowing the kind of uh, conversation with 
the tonal shifts within those material types. So yeah, there's I mean, something yeah, really. Mm-hmm. I was gonna say there's something really sweet about having a certain set of parameters, or at least having a certain priority that you want to double down on, and. Yeah, you know, I'm not advocating 100% surprise, not yet, right? (laughs) I I think I'm more advocating the human is 50% and the material is 50%. And let's just see what happens. Sometimes that means that the material is in our hands and we need to manipulate it somehow. Or that means that we have eyes to put these two pieces of fabric together and see if we like the colors. But then other times, maybe there's room for the fabric to be fabric as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I just think there's such a fun kind of uh, through line in today's conversation. Obviously, Sarah inspired. I mean, Heidi, those white quilts, uh, you know, or those just kind of grabbing scraps and putting them together. Uh, and Zach's really right. Like you kind of, no matter no matter how much we can pretend that it is blind, uh, we still choose where it goes in some ways, you know. And so there's like a like you made those, even if I had the same scraps, I, you know, you give me a box of your scraps that have been created in a lab to be exactly the same scraps that you have, we would make a different object, right? Even if we were pretending that we weren't even choosing, we're grabbing from a bin and we're blindfold, you know, there's still a, the element of the maker uh, that I think is really kind of beautiful. And that's where, I mean, and that's one of the things that I enjoy about looking at quilts and people's make, people's, offerings to the world, be it um, from a high art, big A, you know, gallery, museum standpoint, or uh, like small A, like pumpkin pies at Thanksgiving, like, you know, small A art craft, like the things that people put into the world that they're, that they have um, put their intention through, I think are really beautiful. And I think that there's, there's, there's a lot to be said about kind of uh, the implicit hand of the maker um, and then giving yourself these permission to try things that are um, a surprise. Yeah, oh, I love that idea of like everyone getting the same lab tested, same scraps and seeing what <laughs> comes um, You know, I, I love this theme of curiosity that is is coming through. It certainly is um, something that I'm really excited to talk about in the habits class. When I was recently reading and watching the HBO special of Brene Brown's um, Atlas of the Heart, she talks about over 80 different emotions. And if you can understand and name that emotion, you can better understand how you feel rather than just assuming you're angry, like maybe it's a more specific variation on that. And she spoke, she wrote really beautifully about the idea that create, or sorry, curiosity is both an emotion and a trait and not all emotions are both of those things but that you can be on occasion the emotion of curious but that you can also have a trait of being a curious person and that that is very helpful in life that it allows you to be curious about how things will turn out rather than having a picture of how things should be and then if they're not that way which of course they won't be that way you feel disappointed And that there are a lot of ways you can cultivate the trait of curiosity and that within the microcosm of our creative practice, you can practice curiosity so that then you can take it into other parts of life and be um, feeling more fulfilled and enjoying life that way. So um, gosh, all three of you are much better at thrifting than I am. I get like (laughs) high sensitive person overwhelmed. (laughs) by it and, and I cannot very well but I am so excited to to hand it off to Sarah and see what she does with the same thrift store experience <laughs> yeah so I um feel like I just want to ch- talk about all the things you guys just said rather than show my slides now but I'll try and show my my images and they are highly related. I was thinking about um, this audience and not knowing who the audience was besides you, Heidi, Zach, and Luke. Um, I decided to put together um, something that kind of related to elements of what I think of your practices and we'll talk about that as we go. So I'm going to share. Let me. 
do this. And I put this nice, soft, bulky picture in to get going because I know that you all appreciate, like I do, the pictures of quilts and lumps as opposed to um, fully. Whoops, why isn't this working? There we go. Is that looking good? Okay. So I thought rather than giving like my whole um, bio and a background on all my work and where I come from, I would just dive in and kind of um, do an examination of one quilt and talk about that. But it definitely is going to overlap with some of the issues that we were talking about. Um, everything from using recycled fabric to using colors and um, recycled materials that have very close tones, how to make those choices but also thinking about a lot of um, Zach's interest in particular in memory quilts and quilts that talk about um, people. And I think this is in Heidi's work quite a lot and obviously in Luke's in Luke's because yours is figurative, um, how you think about a human being and represent that in a quilt in a way. And that's not something that I do regularly, but this quilt in particular does have that. Um, so I have some quilts on exhibit right now at the Wisconsin Quilt Museum, and the theme of the exhibit is math. Um, Heidi took a class of mine about two, well, height of the pandemic, total Zoom lockdown class, and the theme was make do. And um, I worked into that class quite a bit of um, my first sort of um, formal digging into how to how to articulate my ideas about math into my quilt design process. So these quilts um, kind of represent, these three quilts are good representatives of that, that part of my process, which is, you know, it is very um, mathematical, it's very planned, but it isn't high math. It's not, it's not rocket science math. It's um, math that anyone can understand. And so right now I'm working on, um, getting ready to head up to Wisconsin for three days to work with high school kids talking about math and quilts and the crossover in those processes. So we're really talking about very basic um, concepts of geometry and how um, understanding things about geometry can help you with quilt design. It can help you understand historic quilts that we all look at and love, vintage quilts. And by doing that, I think it gives you some insight into what in particular, these women knew that we didn't, we don't know, we don't know what was going on in their minds that we look at these quilts and we see what they did. If you start digging into the geometry of it, just like we dig into how they were stitched or what fabrics they use, you get a lot of insight into the kinds of things that they um, understood that maybe we don't so much have on the surface of our minds anymore. So um, my grandma was a quilter and I, didn't really know her, so I wasn't able to inherit and to learn quilting from her directly, but I inherited a big box of unfinished work that she made. And one of the things is um, all of these hexagons, this grandmother's flower garden. And one of the things that I was thinking about during the pandemic when we were in lockdown and very isolated from each other and couldn't go to stores and things, and I am not a shopper. I'm not one of the people who goes to the quilt shop and buys the, the tools for things. Um, but I was thinking about, I was also reading this book about Laura Ingalls Wilder, um, the true story of her life and thinking about what it was like to be really isolated back in the day, a homesteader out in, you know, South Dakota and nobody around for miles, but you know, you're making things, you're doing things, you're building your house, you're making quilts. How did they have this knowledge? What knowledge were they pulling on to figure things out? And one of the things I love about the hexagon quilt is that if you don't have that hexagon just right, it's not going to work. And I don't mean mathematically perfect. I mean, if your sides aren't the same size, when you try and piece one to the other, it's not going to fit. It's just not going to work. And so um, how did they do that? This was a question that came up to me teaching this class. How did they make those hexagons if they were out on the prairie without an internet to download it or a quilt shop to go and buy the template? So my father was a mathematician and he um, he does the kind of math, it's pure math, it's completely 
not um, applied to anything. So it's math for math's sake. So I've always related to him a lot because he understands art for art's sake. He understands math for math's sake. You do it because it's a journey you're on and you're, you're building on knowledge and you're communicating it um, through your work. And so I started talking to him about some of these forms and trying to understand. And I was trying to figure out how you could draft a hexagon um, without any template, you know, without anybody helping you. <laughs> so we had this great back and forth. And this was the last year of his life. And um, it was, you know, all on the internet or all talking on through email or on the phone. And we had a great back and forth talking about just hexagons and other um, pure geometric forms. So um, all these kinds of things that I was seeing in quilts and he was helping me figure out how to draft them by understanding their angles and how they work together. And um, so one of the starting points he led me on was that back in Euclid's time or whatever, the way that people understood these um, polygons, these regular polygons as they're called, um, is by compass and straight edge. You were supposed to be able to draft these things if you had a compass and a straight edge. And it was the relationship of those shapes to each other. So if, for example, you take two um, equal circles that you've drawn with a compass and you know what their um, radius is, you draw another circle um, in that joins from the center point of each circle and overlaps, then the points where they intersect here, here at the centers and here and here is going to create a perfect hexagon. So that's how, um, you know, they were, people were taught many years ago, but I thought, well, what if you don't have a compass? You know, what if you <laughs> can't do, you don't, because if you don't have a compass, you can't draw the perfect circle. If you have a circle that you're using, how do you find the center of it if you don't? So, I have been working on this just because I really enjoy it. So we're not talking about being uptight and feeling that things need to be perfect. It's an investigative process of just really wanting to understand these things. It's almost like a puzzle, but to me, it's become a little bit more obsessive and serious than just like something I do when I'm decompressing. <laughs> So I've been working on ways to do these things with just using blank pieces of paper. So no measurements, no, um, one of the things I love about geometry is it's less about giving numeric value to things. It's about finding relationships between shapes. So you're not trying to say this is six inches and six inches is the right number. What you're trying to say is how does one part of this shape relate to another part of the shape? And that's just, you know, quilters understand this, right? If you, if you work in geometry with quilts. Um, so if you take a normal piece of paper, an eight and a half by 11, and you fold that in half, and we're landscape format here, fold that in half, fold it again, and fold it again. And you need to be perfect with this in the sense of like, if you're doing origami or something, or you need to make sure that your edges are lining up perfectly. But then when you unfold it, you have a piece of paper that has a set of parallel lines. And those parallel lines are going to be your guide for how to create the shape. And there are versions of this that I'm developing that you can do with other um, polygons. If you cut off one edge of that, then that edge now becomes your ruler and your units rather than being inches or anything that you can measure are just knowing that these lines are parallel and that they're equidistant apart, which is what parallel is. Um, and then you can use that ruler to create this polygon. So we've got four, we've got five, lines, um, parallel lines that are going to be the basis of our polygon, you take your ruler and we're going to decide that one side of our hexagon is two units. So we take our, our uh, ruler and I've just made a little mark so you can see the units better, but two units from the edge of that side from the point, this end of that side to the center to the opposite side. So that diagonal is what we're drawing here with um, two units and two units. Because the thing we know about a hexagon is that it's six equilateral triangles. So the distance of a side is the same as the distance to the center. So you do that, draw your X and do it again, going the opposite X from the opposite side over. Once you've done that, you can find the um, perpendicular fold by folding this side to match that side. 
that perpendicular, that point where it meets the top line is going to be what you need to connect now to make your hexagon. And now you have a perfect hexagon. And it's just that basic principle that this side equals this side, to this distance to the center equals this distance to the edge. So this is the kind of stuff I sit around and I do because I think it's fun. I don't think it's a requisite, but it does not only like entertain me, teach me. It also was a way to have a conversation with my dad. It was also a way for me to understand, like I said, how, you know, people in other generations understood things about carpentry, about building, about constructing stuff that we don't necessarily have to understand because we can download it or we can, you know, create, get our templates anywhere. So I think it's fun and I think it's interesting. Um, I also can give you all a very simple way to do this, much simpler than drafting it. but. Um, if you have a set of post-it notes, well, if we know that a hexagon is six equilateral triangles, then take two of those, take one of those post-it notes, fold it in half to find the center, the um, perpendicular center line, which is what's here on this side. And then take two other ones because they have the same size. We know the side of one of these squares is the same as the base. You go from the corner to that center line, from that corner to that center line. Now you have a perfect equilateral triangle. And if you fold that equilateral triangle in half to find the center line and you make two of them and you do the same, you line that um, perpendicular to this perpendicular, you now have a six pointed star, fold those corners in and you have the equilateral, um, I mean the uh, equilateral polygon, the hexagon. So very simple if you have standard squares. So in the meantime, after my father died and we were going through all his stuff, I found in his stuff all of these notes that he'd been writing. So I could was able to view the flip side of our conversations as he was going on his own journey to doing a level of math that is completely beyond me, has nothing to do with my train of thought about. I mean, it had something to do with it, but it was his own sort of journey. And so even though what I'm talking about is really elementary high school geometry, it's showing you again that these, these levels of understanding math and geometry and structures, you know, transcend to lots and lots of depth <laughs> all over. And it was great to see that it was kind of getting his brain going at that point. So after he passed away, I decided to make a, um, the for the first time, make something like a memorial quilt. And I made this quilt um, for my memory of him. And I wanted to base it on this hexagon. So the four corners, and I'm going to show you a big picture, but I just wanted to show you some of the details first. The four corners are four black hexagons. And I cut those creating that me method. I cut templates creating that method. But one of them I made using six equilateral triangles rather than the um, hexagon. But one of the things to notice here is the material. So the... Um, the materials are all black men's shirts, but there's a huge range of blacks in this quilt because again, using recycled fabrics, as Luke was saying, you never have a huge yardage of them. You have these random pieces. And so one of the things that I love is particularly with blacks as they fade, they get different colors. Some go towards purple, some go towards brown or green. So you get all of this nuance, but also you get often and I love looking for things that have very subtle patterns. So the patterns emerge or disappear as you quilt with them. Um, and then the other fabrics in this quilt are blue and they're indigos that um, a friend of mine is a, is a great textile restorer. He works for museums and all kinds of things. And he had a big bundle of um, Japanese um, summer kimonos, cotton kimonos, and they were all lined with indigos. So I pulled all those indigos out. And indigo, as we know, is one of those colors that as it fades and changes, it turns green or it turns purple. It has all of this nuance. So I used those as well. And here's some details. So you can see some of this is more like brown, black plaid. Some of it is brown, is black and silvery, um, different kinds of blues, more green, more purple, and lots of cat hair. Because this quilt is for me and it's on my bed. It lives with me and my partner. And so it isn't meant to be a um, 
clean, precious quilt. But as we know, black is like the worst color for, for pet hair. Um, on the corner, I used a little bit of some wonderful African wax print. Again, these are bits that I find in thrift stores usually turned into garments. So I don't really know the history of this material, but it's clearly an African wax print. And I took the eyes and turned that into just one corner of the binding. So it's this idea of the sort of human spirit being in the quilt. And it's backed all with brown. And there's the quilt completed. So you can really see the kind of range of colors that are in there. And so, I, you know, on the surface, it's just a black and blue quilt, but it has all of these different colors going on. Um, and I built it like a house top. So each quadrant is building out from those hexagons in the four corners. And then I constructed a way to have them overlap each other. And then it's hand quilted. Um, and so one of the things that, we, we were talking about, you know, recycled materials and how you don't get large yardage or they could dictate what you have, dictates what color choices you make. Um, that blue indigo was very, very runny. It's not very stable. So that was one of the reasons that I decided black. It wasn't because I wanted this to be this somber quilt. It wasn't because these are favorite colors of my father or any of those things. It was actually a practical decision. And I liked the combination, you know, so I was I was approving of it, but knowing that if it got washed, that that blue wasn't going to mess up the other colors. And similarly, that's why it's backed in dark brown. So it looks like a very somber quilt, but it all of that was really led by the fact that these there were certain characteristics of this indigo fabric that I was working with in this case. And there's um, another picture of it with my cat sitting right in the middle. They always know where the middle is. Um, and it's all basted, which is just sort of to highlight um, the fact that this is all hand quilted. So when we kind of talk about um, trying to have things be exact or not exact and where the surprises are, um, I think, Luke, you were using the word structure for talking about it. Um, for me, I always talk about it like a skeleton. So you get a skeleton, which is what I like to work out with my graph paper and my pencils. Um, and then you and then the sewing, the process fleshes it out. So these materials flesh it out, the mistakes, not mistakes, but the, the things that you don't know. So I my designs are not exact. I could never sell them as patterns, um, but they are worked out. So I love to figure out the angles and the geometry and all those things. So I kind of know what I'm shooting for, but I don't know how it's going to look. I have no idea how it's going to look. And I don't know until I get those fabrics, until I see what they're doing, until I run out and I have to make a new choice about what to use instead. Um, and those are the surprises, going back to that idea of surprise that I just love. But for me, I think my surprises happen on a larger scale. <laughs> they do happen in little tiny bits too. But sometimes it's like I get a third of the way through and I just have to switch gears and that's all there is to it. So um, a quilt that I'm working on right now, I was like, oh, I'm going to do soft book. I'm going to get this done in time, but it's nowhere, nowhere near done. So I'll show you an in-process picture of it. But this is the drawing. So that gives you an idea of how I kind of figure it out. I figure out the exterior dimension of the quilt that I'm basically what I'm shooting for. And again, it won't end up exactly there because of trimming and things. And then I figure out the major components. So I know that I'm going to be creating units that are related to the overall large scale design. And this is it in process right now. And so basically I am building it concentrically from two different places, from the top and the bottom. So if we go back to the drawing, you can see there's two big um, halves of it, right? And so what I'm doing is I started by creating this little bit here and this little bit here twice over, and then building these wings coming out of that. 
So you can see that the stripes aren't perfect, that the disc that as they're flaying out, it's not perfectly measured. What I want to do is just get like find that balance between what your eye thinks it knows is happening and what is actually happening in the construction, which is not the same thing. Um, and then again, to that issue that um, you brought up, Luke, about matching materials or not matching your materials in these subtle colors, this is a great example because you know, I, you can't, if you're working on this scale, which is 95 by 85 or something, you can't find enough of perfectly matched materials. But I was sort of interested in that with this quilt and because it was built concentrically, I knew I could find enough to sort of build and then use all one and then shift into a new one and then shift into a new one. So often with mine, I'll just mix and match them all together. So they blend. But with this one, I decided not to do that. And I marked the place where they transition from one to the next with a kind of more deliberate um, piecing using up a lot of the smaller scrappy bits. So in the center, it's a warmer brown moving out to a more like dovey gray brown and then moving out to a much lighter brown. And in the end, there will be these sets of circles that um, define those differences. So there's some more details. And you can see how kind of crazy the piecing is as I move out because I don't really have a strategy. I, I have a strategy for the big shapes and how those are going to fit together, but I don't exactly know how I'm going to piece it. So I use my seam ripper like it is going out of style. I have like a big bag of them and I rip seams constantly. I re-piece things. I move things around. I um, I shift things, I trim things. I sometimes things get too ratty by the time I'm ready to do the final assembly. So I have to go back in and like fix stuff. Um, but I feel like I'm kind of having a, a, a big wrestle with my materials at all times, but in a fun way where I don't quite know um, who's gonna win the battle. And I know sometimes I'll concede one battle to my materials and sometimes it'll concede to me. And we're always trying to fight um, in a fun way. So that is what I prepared to share with you all. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. I really liked your idea of um, if you don't have enough, combine it with something else until you do, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, you know, like when you're using rec recycled or scraps or something, you, you've got something that's important. You want that color or you want that idea. Well, mm -hmm. just mix it in with enough stuff until you've got a big enough piece and you're ready to go. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And I, um, I didn't talk about this. A lot of those quilts that I made during the pandemic, I sort of set that rule to myself that I was only going to use for my stash because I have tons of fabric in the house and I worked and that was like the restriction that made those quilts look the way they look. But I have to admit, I love going to thrift stores and I just, I've, find it like therapeutic to just wander around and zone out and not know what, you know, exactly. So my purse is always full of little scraps that I'm trying to match, you know, and things like that. So um, I really enjoy that process and just trying to look for things that are as close as possible, but I know they're not going to be the same. Um, and that's, that's part of what I, I like is that sort of nuance of color that you don't get if you just buy off the bolt. So let me throw a, if I can, sort of sideways, soft, bulky question at you um, that I that, that come came up sort of within your your talk. You're talking about the quilt that you use, right, on your bed, cats on it. Um, so uh, how do I say it? Uh, what? Where do quilts exist in the world for you, right? We all have this this continuum of quilt from uh, hermetically sealed fine art objects that will get acquired by the MoMA and live on into <laughs> austerity forever, all the way down through, um, oh shit, I'm cold. Uh, like, let's just, you know, put this cotton scrap between these fabrics and put it over the window, right? Like, you know, there's this continuum between like pure function, uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder, all the way through like, you know, I'm trying to be the the coolest quilter ever. It's gonna live on forever and famous, you know, MoMA circles, etc. So, like, talk to talk to us a little bit about kind of how you see them quilts existing because as a as a medium, it's got a lot more richness historically from a functional standpoint than just say a you know oil painting or a marble sculpture. Yeah, 
I mean, that's such a huge, a, a wide question because I think um, all the quilts that I make, one of the reasons that I love hand quilting and I make them to that dimension is so that they can be used. They're functional quilts. I don't use them. This is the first quilt that I've made for my own sake, but I've, I've given quilts to people that are used. I've sold quilts to people that are used. So um, very few people have walls that big. So it kind of limits <laughs> what people end up doing with them. In fact, you know, um, they don't end up on walls very often. They have, but not very often. Um, so that's just speaking to my own personal work. But I think that the functional part of quilts, and it doesn't matter what quilt you're talking about, there always is some element of it for the people who've made them in the past and in the present that is also decorative and is also um, not just decorative after it's finished, but is also something that um, the process itself is is the is the reason for doing it. So um, I know looking at my grandmother's quilts, she was probably would win prizes at the state fair for thriftiness because she saved everything. And they lived through the the depression. They had a very hard time. They lost their town to a tornado at one point. I mean, like all the stuff of urban rural, I mean of rural southern-ish. Southern Illinois um, people in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, right? So I know that that quilting, without ever having this discussion with her, I know that that quilting fueled her, her spirit, you know? So it exists as that thing too. So it's, it's both, you know? And that I think that the whole discussion of museums and stuff is just completely irrelevant to that part of that discussion, except that I believe that almost every artist who's in one of those museums also had that in their fueling their spirit to make their work. So I think that's the connection without trying to say what's art and what's not art, what's craft, whatever. And then the warmth thing, I think, helped a woman like my grandmother to know that what she was doing wasn't just frivolous, you know, like this is a thing, now we can use it. So I personally love that. And I, I like the idea that the thing I'm making is to be touched, is to keep you warm. But it, I'm on a journey, just like my math, my dad's weird math <laughs> journey. That's <laughs> just my own, you know, that isn't really, I, I like to talk about it, but I don't really care if other people want to pursue it as well. Like I'm not, I'm not talking about it as a way of like people should do what I do because I really don't think most people should <laughs> unless they're being called coincidentally in the same direction um, because that's just really personal and it's really um, you know and I think all good art artists are doing those things for those reasons as much as they're doing them for what you know whatever their goal is in terms of you know what how that piece is going to be used in the end does that answer the question yeah, yeah. I mean, more, more. I was just was kind of like, just wanting to get an understanding of where quilts live in your life and your under because like some of us use quilts, some of us don't, you know, and they're just mm -hmm. the, across the sort of quilter spectrum. And it's just interesting the the way that people think about them as objects, especially through the filter of soft bulk as a term, right? I mean, I think mm -hmm. you're you're on the quilts hold space sculpturally side of the conversation, which is kind of where we are, but yeah. um, that's not true across the board. So I'm just curious more. Yeah, I, I really want my quilts, no matter what, to be constructed well enough that they have the strength to be washed and handled and, and done, you know, moved around. So um, I think that that's, that's you know, always primary in my mind, even when I'm looking at thrifted materials or whatever, I won't use things that I don't feel like are pretty strong setting in because I know that they will. And that's like one of the first questions I always ask students, you know, what is this going to be for? Because it, how you make it is different depending on what you think about that. So, and neither is right or wrong, but you need to have an answer to that question. <laughs> um, Sarah, one thing that you said that, that really struck me was around warmth as permission to make a quilt and I certainly think a lot about about that too like I have last last time on soft bulk I shared about my to-do list and all of the computer work and writing work and applications and other other things and then like 
where does actually sewing a quilt fall on the priority list? Mm. Sometimes it can be strikingly low compared to the other things that I have to do, even though I am a professional quilter. And <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of the great ironies is just having time to sew. Um, and, and, and so that just, um, yeah, I, I think is a really beautiful reminder that a lot of people for such a long time have had to struggle to figure out how do I move this higher on my to-do list because I really mm -hmm. want to do it. And that that simple fact of warmth is something that can bring it a little higher on the to-do list. And then and then you get to figure out how to make a hexagon and do and, and figure out <laughs> choices and practice being curious and, and all these other things. But what what is it that gives you the permission to do that instead of saying, oh, I don't have enough time or whatever else that can come into the mix? Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm looking at all these faces on the screen right now and almost everybody's sewing. And you, one of the things that I know is that like, uh, I need to have my hands busy. I'm not, I'm not good if I don't feel like I'm doing something. And I, I believe that I inherited that from my grandmother. Like my mother had it. I have it. Um, it's, it's a cultural indoctrination of this idea that you don't sit still. You don't just, you know, not do something. So, well, I don't, um, so one of the reasons I love hand quilting as opposed to machine quilting is it gets me out of my studio. I can sit on my couch. I can chat with people. I can take it to other people's houses, but I still feel like I'm doing something. You know, I'm not just watching Netflix and it's this weird, I mean, I probably should analyze it more deeply, but it's this weird thing that makes me feel okay about not um, sitting still. And so I think that I think that that is is a big part of it. I think it's it's um, the idea that you can always be working <laughs> and, <laughs> and never not working. And I love what you were saying, Heidi, about like having to remind yourself sometimes that you are working, you know, that you're I mean, on your own stuff um, and quilting. You know, that's why it survives so long for so many people in our in our world, because rich people, poor people, all kinds of people is because it's, you can pick it up, you can put it down, you can always be doing it. And um, it has pretty low stakes in terms of, you know, being able to decide that that's what you want to do with your time. So. Yeah, there, there's so many things that I love about it, especially compared to other art mediums where you have to clear a space or change mm -hmm. your clothes or open all the caps or close all the caps or wrap mm -hmm. it up or dry it out or has this moment where it's really fragile and can break in a second and mm -hmm. quilts just don't have any of those limitations and that's one of the top reasons why quilting drew me more than other art mediums yeah and, and certainly you know lately I've been a mentor with the Milwaukee Artist Resource Network and we have a mm -hmm. lot meetings that are for me as a mentor that are optional but I'm really excited to go see an artist lecture or take a class on social media or other things so I've been attending a lot of them and I'm the only person working during the meeting mm. I I maybe someone's doodling in their margin of their notes but honestly right. <laughs> for a lot of people who are like drawing as their medium I haven't even seen a lot of drawing on the side during these lectures and it's sweet how they comment to me and they're like, Heidi, you're so productive. Every time you come here, you're selling, you're working on something. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I feel like I certainly have um, in, in my family that like Protestant idol hands ethic of like, gotta always be making something. And I remember mm -hmm. my grandpa commenting that my great grandma Moosey was the same way. And and getting to go that far back in, in the genealogy is such an incredible feeling. Yeah. Um, you know, that also reminds me that you were sharing about your dad and mm -hmm. we are, um, you are the third guest in a row who's in the Counting Threads exhibit. And it's just intentional and exciting to be able to highlight that exhibition and math. And our first guest who was on that was Jackie Gehring. And she shared really beautifully about a piece that she made about her dad as well. And, um, you know, certainly Zach does incredible work with memory quilts. And I'm, I'm working on a, a 
an exhibition that I'm co-curating with Nirmal Raja, who is another Mary Knoll finalist. Mm -hmm. And her mother-in-law passed away and she um, left behind a lot of saris. And so we've mm -hmm. distributed those saris to people and they're adding them. And it's gonna be my first time that I actually cut into a piece of fabric from my dad. Um, I'm going to use one of his shirts and I, you know, I thought, I thought I would start sewing into them right away. And I attended a Sherry Linwood lecture and I was really thinking like, oh, I'm going to do it soon. And so now it's over four years later that I'm, uh, I, I think I've plucked up the courage. I'm going to cut, choose a shirt and cut into it mm -hmm. soon. And it's just, um, I, I wonder if you could share a little bit more about that process for you. I imagine you maybe have some of your dad's clothes too, or you're thinking about using them, or if you just um, sharing a little more on that subject of memory quilting. And... Yeah. Well, I mean, this was a completely new thing for me. I've never done anything like that. I have um, had a few students very who have passed away, and before they died, they asked me to complete projects for them, for pe members of their family. And that was a really interesting experience, but that was probably the closest I've ever come to doing anything remotely like this. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, I think that these quilts really are different in that those fabrics were not his fabrics. And I don't have any, I think I might have like some of his old t-shirts that I just like, but they're not meant for quilts. Um, but there's so many ways to think about memory and some of them are physical objects and some of them are ideas or some of them are all these things and I think that I also um I think I think this quilt in particular is really is more about that connection between geometry and quilt making and um math and quilts in and that was a connection that we had so it's it's more about that I think than the physical materials the um he was he his family came from Japan he was born in California so there was some sentimentality to using that Japanese indigo but um maybe a little bit of irony too because so often when you're an immigrant family people want to like be able to um say that your experience is the same as the country that you come the like that that material would have the same meaning to you that it would have to somebody who was actually from that country. And it's not true with him. I mean, they never wore into, you know, indigo kimonos or summer kimonos or anything like that in their lives. So it, it's, it is a, it is a reference to a beautiful material, but it's not really, um, it's, it's maybe just, it, maybe it's the combination of that and the sort of American generic men's black shirts, you know, it's that, Thing. So maybe there is something there too. Um, I, I'm kind of a person who dances around things until I sort of start to zero in. And I don't, I don't necessarily have it very good. It's the way I design too, right? It's not necessarily very clear until it's finished. So mm. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I don't think I could easily work with his actual clothing, partly because his clothing wouldn't be that suitable to quilts, but it also, I think that would be a harder thing. So I can see why waiting four years makes sense for you, Heidi. I think that's harder than to approach it from an abstract direction, you know, which is more what I did. Yeah. 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 I just, cause I was like, where do I store clothes? And I put most of them in my own closet because I had some mm -hmm. space in there. And then once in a while I'll pull something out and be like, hmm, I think I could wear this. We're yeah. like, I'm taller than my dad was, but yeah. <laughs> his shirts seem to fit me really well. And yeah. so then once I learned that I could keep them as shirts and wear them, uh, it, it made it even harder to decide to cut into them because it's yeah. you know, re removing this other possible future that they have. Um, yeah. For Halloween, I'm going to be Andy Warhol, and I think I'm going to wear one of my dad's suit coats too. Oh my God, Andy! So, <laughs> okay, I can't wait for those photos. Uh, I have I have a good wig that I got. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to jump in and say that. Well, oh, Sarah, I got a question for you, but for folks like you, Heidi, who are about to cut into loved ones' clothing, one little practical tidbit that I'll often pass along because it just feels it opens the door for a lot of people so if this helps 
take it and use it. But a lot of times like dress shirts or something, you, you, it is hard to cut those threads and, and separate a sleeve or something off of a shirt. But if you start with something that's like a pocket that you can unpick, it doesn't do any damage to the integrity of the garment. Then at least you say you have in the back of your mind that if you change your mind, you can always sew that pocket back on and no harm is done. And mm -hmm. I think starting with something like a pocket can be a really gentle, open place to start if you're not ready just to dive right on in. Thank you. Um, Sarah, I also want to say thank you for blowing our minds the last hour and a half change. And <laughs> I, I just, I, I felt like you were speaking to us now, but I also felt like you were speaking very specifically to me 10 years ago when I was just starting quilting, because I remember seeing your quilts for the first time. You're one of the few quilters that I can say that about, you know, the, mm -hmm. like when I grow up, I want to make quilts just like Sarah Nishio, you know, like that kind of, like I was just so enamored with your quilts. I, I loved the, um, I love the fact that you can look at a Sarah Nishio quilt and we know who made it, right? Like you have mm -hmm. a very strong voice in, in your work. And I love how you, I think you, you said it when you were talking to us, something like you like playing in that space between what your eye actually sees and what your eye thinks it sees. I love mm -hmm. that. I love thinking about that kind of breathing room that you have in your geometry. One question I have for you is, cause I'm thinking back to my first quilt. What did your first quilt look like? Mm -hmm. And how, how is your approach evolved over time? So I made my first, discounting all those things that were like when I was, you know, 12. Um, I made my first quilt when I was about 22. And I was just, you know, living on my own after college for the first time. And I just got it in my head, I'm going to make a quilt. And I didn't know anything about what I was doing. And I went to the thrift store because I was really into thrifting then anyway, and just bought a bunch of stuff. And I just like wrestled it. It's talk about like having a battle with the fabrics and it was all hand sewn because I didn't have a machine. And I just made a whole load of stars that I just cut out of crazy triangles and I pieced them together. And I um, just kept stitching until it was a solid thing. You know, like <laughs> that's sort of how I made it. And I hand quilted it. And it's funny to look at it now because parts of it I use like a double thread and parts of it I used a single thread and part, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, I actually showed that in a class. I think Heidi's seen it because yeah. I, I brought it out of the woodwork when I did a lecture about stars and the whole lecture was about the geometry of stars, but I wanted to finish with reiterating the fact that it wasn't like an expectation that people who want to represent stars need to know all this geometry there's a million ways to do it so I went back to that original quilt which is the most ungeometric approach to making stars um so I did that one but then I really didn't make any other quilts until I was probably about 10 years later in my early 30s which is when friends were having babies and things like that so um and by then, like the G's Bend quilts had been traveling around the nation. Um, people like Denise Schmidt and other artists were making quilts that were really um, showing that you could do things in a, in a less precise, geometric, traditional American quilt tradition way. Um, so those early quilts were kind of more along those lines. But, um, you know, I, I studied a painting. I was a painter. Um, that's where my degrees are. And I was very interested in geometric abstraction. So I kind of came into textiles as sources for inspiration for painting. So really thinking about some of these very minimal um, things. And so once I decided to make quilts that weren't just as gifts, but as my practice, because I had to give up um, oil painting for various logistical reasons, <laughs> um, I, I really was thinking about my paintings and I still think about my paintings all the time. And I think that that's another reason I really like working with recycled materials is that now that I have like closets full of gray <laughs> fabrics and things, it's much more like painting in that you can choose your colors and you have all of this, all of this um, nuance that doesn't exist if you just go to Joanne Fabrics or something and buy it off the bolt. Um, so, that's kind of been a big part of the journey is just sort of reconciling that all that art school stuff about color and tone and 
uh, composition and all of those things to this tradition that I just deeply love. And I love looking at historic quilts and seeing them doing something that's right on the money with what I'm interested in too. And I just know that it's it's all around, you know? New under the fun. <laughs> Zach, I have a Sarah Nishura story like that also. Um, oh. In 2014, I moved to Chicago to become a quilter nine months after having made my first fabric quilt. Like it was a little bit crazy, but it was right. And I like hadn't ever met any professional quilters in person. Like I was looking at Luke online and looking at Mora online and and then I was uh, really freshly in Chicago and I went to the Lil Street Art Center in Ravenswood where I happened mm -hmm. to by coincidence live because one, like, I spent, I looked at three apartments <laughs> before I moved to Chicago. Like, mm -hmm. I had to just get it done quick and walked into the gallery and was just shocked to see quilts on the wall and that that was the current exhibit at the local art space, art gallery and they were Sarah's. And it was amazing to see her quilts on display in relation with her husband's pottery. And then I discovered there was a lecture happening for her husband. Um, I think maybe I'd missed Sarah's lecture time. I didn't do one. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> they didn't invite me for that. Um, and so I was there um, at your husband's lecture and then like saw you in the back of the room and I was so starstruck. Like this woman this is a real professional quilter. That's ridiculous. I, I was like so shy and came up and said hello. And I don't think you remember it. I mean, from that. I do. I do remember that, Heidi, but I don't think I knew. I don't think I knew at the time that you were like a new quilter. I just thought you were another quilter who, you know, I was like, I practice, was... like I'm a quilter. <laughs> that sentence. That's, that's the part I didn't know. I think I just thought, oh, this is so nice. Here's another quilter in Chicago. I get to know, you know, cause I didn't know very many people back then. Mm -hmm. And I still don't really like know a lot of, I, I know the names, I know the Instagram stuff, but I don't, I don't, you know, I know as many artists in all fields as I know quilters. So it's kind of a, you know, all a mystery to me still. <laughs> My story about Heidi is, and it's a Lil Street one. So Heidi and this other person from Lil Street, who was an artist in residence at Lil Street, and the person who was directing the fiber program there were Nora and Trisha and Heidi. And we all went out, I think we went to Milwaukee for a day and we visited each other's studios and stuff. And we were here in my house at the end of the day. And the, I felt like it was like an intervention. The three of them sat me down and they were like, you have to get on Instagram. I'm like, I don't have to get on Instagram. I don't know what Instagram is. And they like wouldn't quit. Like, do you remember how persistent oh, I you guys were? Remember, yeah. I don't know if you planned that but ahead of time. People need I... to know about Sarah. <laughs> but I was like, they're not going to know because I go on Instagram. What are you talking about? So we had a very hilarious, but I give Heidi and Trisha and Nora the credit for like just literally bullying me into doing something I had no intention of doing. And now I've met so many nice people. <laughs> And I met you, Zach, because I sent you an email because I was doing a lecture on community and quilting, and I really adored what you were doing with the banners at the time, the, the Disappeared, that project, and I knew about it, and I just thought, I'll just see if he has anything to say, and I remember quoting you extensively in that lecture that you sent me a really nice, thoughtful message about your thoughts about that project and and more broadly about why sewing something was more you know meaningful than just you know printing it on a piece of paper or whatever so that was that was lovely and Luke I don't know when I met you I feel like you maybe we met through Joe Cunningham for sure but I don't, I don't know. And you were in that show in California at Roderick's show with me, but I didn't meet you then. Like we've sort of been dancing around each other a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. What a deep pleasure this conversation has been. Thank you guys. It's been um, fun. Yeah, and especially if you are watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe and add some comments. We do try to check in on the comments later and 
share the lecture far and wide with the, the link. Um, Sarah, what do you know that I, I was trying to look up during your lecture books about Laura Ingalls Wilder, and there are a few of them. Do you know the title or the author of the specific one you enjoyed? Yeah, the one I love is called Prairie Fires, and I'm I'm spacing on the name of the author right now, but it was it was a Pulitzer Prize winner. I mean, it's oh, it's one. amazing, and and one of the things that you'll like, Heidi, is it talks a lot about Wisconsin because how their family got to Wisconsin in the first place, but the whole thing is really about the context of that time period and and what it meant to be a human like Laura in the world more than it's you know parts of it stray into being very gossipy and stuff but most of it is really like just gave me a sense of what they were up against the reality of it versus those books and, and concurrently I was rereading all the books too which was a lot of fun but um, those were written for children they didn't want to be as brutal as the reality of it was um, you know so it's it's really interesting and it's interesting just in terms of women's history to think about what it meant to be um, a woman in that exact moment in time. So really, really highly recommend that book to anyone. Thank you. I will I will definitely pull that up. Um, oh, somebody put it on the chat. It's Carolyn Frazier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As a kid, my mom read all of those books to me and my brother, like in my bed before we went to sleep. And I think that's a big part of why I love audiobooks so much. It helped mm -hmm. me learn to process things auditorily rather than just by reading with my eyes. Um, I've read 33 audiobooks so far this year. I feel mm -hmm. very proud. It was another 2022 goal. So I will I will add that one to my list. That sounds very special. Um, but yeah, there, there are a lot of links that we referred to, and those will all be in the um, YouTube notes. Um, we'll be adding those. Any last thoughts? Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you everyone who attended. It's so wonderful to have you here. Happy birthday, Char. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>